Good morning. Today is the 21st day of Tevis, the 2nd of January. We're up to the third reading of Shemot. And in the third reading, we finally encounter Moses the first time. And there is a contradiction, a paradox in his behavior that we have to pay attention to and try to explain. First time he comes out, he sees an Egyptian striking a Hebrew man, and he turned this way and turned that way, and he perceived that there was no one. He turned this, uh, and so he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So that sounds like he's a very, he's a very uh, courageous person and with a lot of uh, moral character. But then the second day he goes out and he sees two people, these are two Hebrews, and they are fighting with each other. And he says to one, why will you hit, he says to the one he calls the evil one, he calls him apparently the evil one, why would you hit your brother? And so they answer in a way that shocked him. They say, why, what, what's it to you? Do you plan on killing us like you killed the Egyptian? And so Moses hears this and he says, I've been found out. And what does he do? He's full of fear. And he hears then that Pharaoh wants to kill him for what he did. And he flees and he ends up in Midian. Okay, so these are the first two events. The first one, he sh shows a lot of courage. The second one, very hard to understand. Why doesn't he just get rid of these two Hebrews <laughs> who are obviously out to get him the same way that he got rid of the Egyptian? He's a prince. I mean, could it really be that hard? Is he really unable to take care of his own business? That he has to run away, that it turns into a whole scandal and he ends up running away? But then see what happens after that. Next verse, he goes to Midian. And the priest of Midian has seven daughters. And they're coming to the well to fill the troughs with, uh, troughs with water for their father's flocks. But shepherds come and drive them away. And then Moses arises again and he rescues them and he waters the flocks. So again we see a person full of courage. What's going on? But then, in tomorrow's reading, we're going to read about his encounter in the wilderness with God, who wants to entrust him with the mission of taking the Israelites out of Egypt. And here, once again, we ask, where did the courageous person go? Because he argues with God, according to the sages, for seven days. It's easy to see it in the verses, actually, if you pay a little bit of attention. He's there for seven days. He argues with God. He doesn't want to go on the mission. But even more troubling than that, not only does he not want to go on the mission, but he keeps claiming that the Israelites won't listen to him. They won't believe that God had revealed himself to him. And so God says, I'll give you a, I'll give you a sign. And so he gives him the first sign, which is throw your staff down. The staff turns into a snake. And what does Moses do? He runs away. <laughs> Thank God it has to bring him back. And says, okay, grab him, by the, grab him by the tail. And so he does, and it turns back into a staff. There is a seesaw here between Moses being a very courageous individual who has a lot of moral character and someone who seems to be very soft-hearted and has no standing and isn't able to fight for his own. And it's very troubling. What, what, what is going on here? So, in t so the thing we want to notice about, well, we want to ask, first of all, which is he? Is he soft-hearted or is he brave? And the answer is that he's actually not really soft-hearted and he's not actually brave. What he is, is he has self-nullification. And this is an interesting concept. We've talked about it many times we have to understand exactly what self-nullification means. Self-nullification also goes through 
uh, certain processes. And you can sort of see that Moses is finding out what this self-nullification is about. We talked yesterday about his being taken out of the water, and we explained that that means that by his nature, he doesn't have physical cravings. He's not, he's not a person who would seek pleasure in this world. He's looking at the, at the higher, higher purpose of life. And so people like that tend to be nullified. They tend to not look at what they want and what they need. But it takes time to balance that as well. And basically what Moses is going through is the process of coming to terms with the fact that someone who is, self, who is, who is nullified, who, who has self-nullification, who cancels himself, also has to do many things in the world by virtue of that characteristic. Just by virtue of being someone who's self-nullified, God chooses him to conduct a mission and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And the mission requires exactly the opposite. He can't stand before Pharaoh as someone who is <laughs> with self-nullification because Pharaoh is not going to be very uh, impressed by that and it's not going to work. So actually, Moses doesn't have so much of a problem doing that. That's how he stood up to the Egyptian as the first act when he killed him and he put him in the sand. That's how he also stood up to the shepherds who were harassing the daughters of the priest of Midian. Because when it comes to his people, whomever his people are, and it's very interesting, we see this from the beginning, and one day his people is a, a Hebrew slave being uh, tortured. The next day, it's a group of seven women who are not Jewish, they're not Hebrews, they're Midianites. And he stands up to them uh, for, for, for their cause. Moses sees a very wide range of who are my people. And when it comes to standing up for them, he steps up and he does what needs to be done. He has a lot of pride in his belief in the solidarity that he has with his people. And that gives him much strength. And that strength is actually called strength of being, strength of existence. When it comes to confronting his own people, same people, but this time confronting them, and this time telling them off, and this time, the first time was with the two people who were fighting with each other, feuding with each other, he couldn't stand up to them. Because there his self-nullification comes into play and he feels, who am I to get rid, let's call it, of somebody from my people just because they're after me? <laughs> That's what self-nullification is. He's going to be walked all over. Because when it comes to his people, he says something very interesting. He says, it's not worth it to me to bring some out and not others. In other words, it's either everyone or not everyone. That's exactly what his claim is to God. Send the one you are used to sending. He says to him, don't send me, send the one you are used to sending. And the sages say, say what he means is, don't send me because I already see that I won't be able to bring everyone out. Send the Messiah himself. He will be able to bring everyone. But I can't. And if it's like that, I don't want to do this. I, this is not a mission for me. Meaning Moshe, Moses is too soft in this area. Well, not too soft. He just, he's soft. He's soft-hearted. He can't, he, he can't choose and say, okay, there are people that are going to be against me, maybe personally, maybe for some other reason, and therefore they won't come out into the wilderness. They won't be saved from the uh, Egyptian exile. They won't, be, they won't come to Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. I don't want that on me. If you, God, want to bring everyone out, send the person who can bring everyone out. That's not me. So when it comes to his confrontation with his own people, he's soft. He can't confront them. Later on in chapter 15, we'll see the uh, seminal statement that he says 
about himself and Aaron at the time they were the most successful people in the history of the world. They had done something nobody had ever done. They had conquered an empire with their hands without even sh sh shooting a bullet, as they say. And yet, when the people come to them with uh, complaints that there's not enough water, there's not enough food, there's not this, there's not that, they don't come and say, okay, we'll take care of it, because we took care of everything until now. They don't aggrandize themselves. Moses says, we are nothing. Really, the ones you want to talk to, uh, the, the one you should complain to is God, not us. When it comes to confronting his people, he's always nullified. He's never willing to bring, and, and later on we'll see with Korach, I think we actually saw that uh, last year, his confrontation with Korach is the first place where he's actually willing to come and confront another one of his people. Until then, he's not willing to do it at all. He's always um, forgiving, he's always forbearing, he's always annulling himself, all for the benefit of someone, someone else from his people. Again, when it comes to fighting what later Maimonides will call the wars of God, fighting against Pharaoh, fighting against these shepherds, fighting against the first Egyptian who was torturing his, uh, a Hebrew, there he is being. He has a sense of, of, of self and he's very powerful. When it comes to confronting his people, he's always preferring to lose, even be chased out of his home, Loses lose everything he has, loses status as a prince in Egypt, lose everything, even maybe his plans that he might have had in place to free the slaves at some point when he became the, the pharaoh. He's willing to lose all that, all that because he's not willing to confront. He's not willing to fight with one of his people. We see this in his name. How is this in his name? In Hebrew, his name has three letters, Mem, Shin, and He. The first and last letter, Mem and He, they spell the word Ma. We mentioned before that in chapter 15 he's going to say the seminal statement, We are nothing. The way he says this in Hebrew is, Venachnu, we are Ma. We are nothing. Ma is like saying nothing, not. So the external letter, letters of his name spell this word nothing. That's his that's, the, that's the, the, the face that he shows his people. The middle letter is the Shin. And Shin stands for either fire in the Book of Formation, or, more importantly in our case, it stands, stands for being, Yesh. The Shin is Yesh. To be a Yesh means to be someone. When it comes to fighting for the rights of his people, for their survival, for their benefit, there he suddenly becomes very powerful, he becomes a, a being, he becomes full of pride in his abilities, in what he's capable of doing. And this is actually the paradox that every person has to carry with him, that's what Moses is teaching us, that I have to be very clear about what my limits are, and what my scope is. When it comes to my people, I can't afford to win against them. My purpose is to help them not to win against them. So if it means losing, okay, so I'll lose. But when it comes to defending them from that which is outside, there I have to have being. There I have to have a sense of self. There I have to have pride in what I represent and what I am. And that is the uh, uh, explanation for Moses' different behaviors in each case. And as we'll continue on and seeing his, uh, his uh, conduct, we'll see more examples of this and uh, perhaps have a chance to even uh, go a little bit deeper into understanding this uh, dichotomy in his uh, soul. So thanks for joining today. Hope to see you tomorrow.